Where do Neanderthals fit in the human story? What if extinction doesn't roar with chaos or meteors, but fades in silence? 40,000 years ago, beneath the same stars we see tonight, a kind of human warmed their hands beside a cave fire. They sang, painted red ochre on stone, raised children, and hunted reindeer across frozen valleys. And then the song stopped. Not from war, not from weakness, but from arithmetic. Because sometimes a species doesn't die in battle, it dies in equation. When the numbers fall too low, chance itself becomes the predator. This isn't the story of monsters or myths. It's the story of our closest kin, the Neanderthals, and the quiet mathematical tragedy that erased them from the earth. Did Neanderthals really disappear after all? For more than 300,000 years, Neanderthals ruled the cold half of the old world. They endured ice ages that would have frozen our city solid, hunted mammoth and bison, and left behind tools so sharp that even modern flint nappers struggled to copy them. They built hearths, cared for their sick, and in Spain's La Pasiega Cave, painted abstract symbols 64,000 years ago, before Homo sapiens ever reached Europe. Then, in barely a geological blink, they vanished. Camps went dark. Footprints faded under snow. For decades, we blamed the obvious, climate collapse, smarter rivals, or disease. But ancient DNA told another story, one not of catastrophe, but of numbers, mutations, and isolation. In the marrow of their bones lies proof that the Neanderthals didn't lose a war they ran out of people. Before we uncover how an entire species could vanish without a fight, subscribe to Root and Relic, where every genome, every fossil, and every forgotten burial reveals not just how humans survived, but why others didn't. The investigation began with a spoonful of bone dust. In 2022, Geneticists at the Max Planck Institute sequenced DNA from a Neanderthal girl in Siberia's Chagirskaya cave and found her parents were as closely related as half-siblings. Soon other samples told the same tale. Vindija, 33.19 in Croatia. El Cidron in Spain. The Altai Neanderthal in the Caucasus. Each genome carried long identical runs of DNA signatures of inbreeding stretching back generations. Across all Eurasia, the total Neanderthal population may once have reached 50,000, but their effective breeding population, the number of individuals actually passing on genes, rarely exceeded 1,000. In some isolated regions, it sank to mere hundreds. When populations get that small, biology turns against them. Random genetic drift amplifies harmful mutations. A single harsh winter, a failed hunt, or one epidemic doesn't just take lives, it wipes out entire lineages. Sequencing revealed the cost. Their Y chromosomes showed striking uniformity. Their mitochondrial DNA narrowed like a river entering a canyon, and their tool layers thinned. Fewer hearths, fewer blades, fewer graves. Even the genes responsible for DNA repair and immune response carried damaging variants, the kind that only appear when diversity collapses it wasn't strength or intelligence they lacked. It was genetic room to breathe. The Neanderthals were dying long before the last fire went out, and their extinction had already begun inside their cells. Picture Ice Age Europe from the sky, a frozen map flickering with campfires. Spain, France, the Caucasus, Siberia. Each glow marks a Neanderthal clan, small, tough, and alone. Now imagine the lights dimming, one by one. Between 70,000 and 45,000 years ago, the planet convulsed in violent climate swings known as Heinrich events. During Heinrich event four, temperatures plunged nearly 10 degrees Celsius in just decades. Grasslands turned to tundra, rivers shifted course, forests vanished under dust and ice. For a species already scattered into family-sized groups, every freeze was a new wall between them. Trade of stone, pigments, or mates collapsed. Contact, the oxygen of culture, thinned out. 
Their Mousterian toolkits stagnated for tens of millennia, and even the brief spark of Chattel Peronian innovation in France faded fast, perhaps borrowed from arriving humans they'd soon never meet again. Archaeologists can see it in the soil. Thick hearth layers replaced by thin ash bands, tool counts dropping by half, bones of herd animals disappearing from caves that once overflowed with them. Isolation didn't just shrink their world, it shrank imagination itself. By the time the first Homo sapiens crossed into Europe, most Neanderthal populations were already ghosts of themselves, few in number, trapped in valleys, running out of time. Then came us. Small bands of Homo sapiens drifted north from the Levant and Anatolia, following rivers and coastlines. They carried not just sharper tools, but something far more powerful, connection. Their social webs stretched hundreds of kilometers. They swapped shells from the Red Sea for flint from the Balkans and painted stories that traveled faster than their feet. When these newcomers met Neanderthals, there was no war. There was curiosity and union. Every person outside Africa today still carries 1 to 2% Neanderthal DNA, relics of encounters roughly 60,000 years ago. Collectively, humanity preserves nearly 20% of the Neanderthal genome, scattered like sparks across our chromosomes. But the exchange was unequal. Early interbreeding flowed both ways. Later, almost only one. Modern human genes rarely entered Neanderthal populations again. Their groups were too small, too isolated, to absorb new diversity. Within a few millennia, Homo sapiens filled every refuge the Neanderthals once held. It wasn't conquest by weapon. It was replacement by arithmetic. Thousands of us for every dozen of them. Before we move on, pause for a thought. If you met a Neanderthal today, Face to face, would you see a stranger or family? Tell me below, because what happens next shows how even nature itself seemed to choose a side. Around 39,000 years ago, the Earth erupted. Near modern Naples, the Companion Ignimbrite super eruption hurled more than 150 cubic kilometers of ash into the sky. Enough to blanket the continent from Italy to Ukraine. For months, the sun dimmed. Temperatures fell by nearly five degrees Celsius. Ash coated forests, poisoned water, and buried the last good hunting grounds. For the Neanderthals, already reduced to a few hundred breeding adults, it was disaster in slow motion. Archaeological layers from Southern Europe suddenly fall silent. No hearths, no tools, no bones. Entire valleys that once held clans became sterile ash plains. Yet extinction wasn't instant. Tiny refugees hung on. The Caucasus, pockets of southern France, and the sea caves of Gibraltar. There, a few families clung to life, gathering shellfish and lighting fires beneath an ashen sky. But isolation had become a prison. When the smoke cleared, the survivors were too few to find one another again. Nature had turned their continent vast. Too vast for voices that had grown too few. The lights on the map flickered once more and began to go out for good. On the cliffs of Gibraltar, in a cave called Gorums, the smoke of their final hearth still clings to the ceiling. Carbon dating shows those last Neanderthals lived here until about 40,000 years ago, centuries after their cousins had vanished elsewhere. Imagine that winter. Atlantic winds howling through the rocks, the sea glinting under a dark sky, and a handful of families huddled around a shrinking fire. They still shaped flint blades, hunted ibex, and cradled their children. But each lost hunter, each failed birth, meant fewer voices at the fire. Thousands of kilometers away, in Siberia's Denisova cave, another fragment of their story surfaced. A bone from a young girl whose mother was Neanderthal and father Denisovan, the only known first-generation hybrid of two extinct humans. Her existence proved that even on the edge of extinction, they still reached across species lines, searching for connection. But nature's math was unforgiving. Their numbers never rebounded. Births no longer kept pace with deaths. Across Europe, the last embers dimmed 
one by one, until only silence remained. The Neanderthals didn't fall in a final battle. They faded, outnumbered, outconnected, and outlasted. Extinction didn't erase them. It rewrote them, inside us. Every living person outside Africa carries hundreds of Neanderthal genes, silent passengers that still influence how we look, heal, and endure. Some strengthened immunity, improved fat storage in cold climates, and thickened our keratin-rich skin and hair. Others shape our circadian rhythms, helping us adapt to short winter days and long northern nights. Recent studies revealed deeper links. A Neanderthal gene cluster on chromosome 3 increases the risk of severe COVID-19 by up to 60%, while another variant on chromosome 12 offers protection. Some alleles affect pain perception, nicotine addiction, and even mood regulation. On average, East Asians carry 2.3%, Europeans about 1.8% of their DNA. But across all modern humans combined, Scientists estimate we collectively preserve nearly 4 billion base pairs of Neanderthal code. Their story didn't end in those caves. It continues in the way your skin reacts to sunlight, the way you sleep through winter, the way your immune system fights disease. You are not merely descended from survivors. You are a mosaic of the vanished. So why did they disappear? Because biology runs on numbers, not nostalgia. Once a breeding population drops below a few hundred, randomness becomes lethal. A broken leg, a bad winter, one lost generation, and the recovery curve collapses. Simulations by geneticists show that when effective population size dips under 500 individuals per region, extinction becomes mathematically inevitable within millennia. That was the Neanderthal trap. Every setback echoed louder than any success. Isolation magnified loss. Mutation outran diversity. They weren't outsmarted or outfought. They were outnumbered by the arithmetic of life itself. And that same law still stalks the modern world. The Vaquita porpoise, the Sumatran tiger, the languages spoken by fewer than 50 people, all live on the same knife edge. When the web of connection frays, extinction doesn't thunder. It simply starts. Their fate wasn't inevitable. It was preventable. If only there had been more of them, more links more voices. And that's their warning to us. Survival isn't about domination. It's about connection. Somewhere, 40 millennia ago, in a cave where waves echoed through stone, a child watched the last fire die. They couldn't have known that they were the end of their kind, that no other voice would ever call out in that language again. And yet, they didn't vanish their blood still runs quietly beneath our skin. Their genes light up in our cells every time we heal, every time we breathe cold air, every time we dream. We are their echo, the living continuation of their unfinished song. When you look in the mirror, you're not just seeing modern humans. 